very young. And as usual, my presentations wander all over the place. I have no idea where I'm going. But hopefully I do. And at the end, it all of a sudden will come together. What's she got? Well, Mitch has scarlet fever, apparently. Yours. What do you mean? Well, Facebook, that was on Facebook the other month, and they had her down as having scarlet fever. No. Well, that's the way you on Facebook can do, isn't it? Actually, she, she has smallpox. And smallpox has killed probably 50 or 60 million people in the last 150 years. Yeah, yes, small yeah, small yeah. Okay. And uh, the first treatment for smallpox was by a man called uh, Edward Jenner, who was very observant, and he noticed something that the milking maids who milked the cows and got cowpox recovered, and they were covered with little pustules, and then uh, the pustules would burst and uh, they would get better, but they never seemed to get smallpox. So he concluded that uh, there might be a connection. So he got a little orphan, his name was Charlie Phipps. You wouldn't, what he did wouldn't get past the ethics <laughs> committee these days, but he took him and uh, took a scalpel and scratched a little spot on his arm, and you can see Charlie doesn't look too happy about it and uh, he smeared it with uh, cowpox pustules and sure enough he got cowpox and about a month later he caught up with him and brought him in and scratched the skin again and put in smallpox deadly deadly thing to do and then they watched him and he never got smallpox and so he had invented the vaccine, uh, which comes from the word cow. Um, and uh, they started to kill off smallpox. It took quite a while, until 1977. This man's name is Ali Mao, and he was the last person, he was a cook. He was the last person in the world to be cured of smallpox. And what they did, they got a vial of it and uh, split it into t two and uh, one, uh, sorry, into three. One was to be, well, they had to make a decision. Was this an opportunity to wipe it out, incinerate the germ, because there's no longer any smallpox in the world except in those three vials, test tubes? Or should they keep it in case somebody came up with germ warfare or by some chance the, the germ reactivated and they would have some in the laboratory so they could immediately work on the cure? So which should, what should they do? Keep well, they kept it in a, in, a, in a boat. They kept it. One went to the United States, Atlanta, one went to Moscow, and one went to Birmingham. And it was put into the care, and they actually put out World Health, smallpox is dead. And it was put into the care of this man, Professor Henry Benson. And being a true scientist, he's looking at this thing and he thought, yeah, I'd just like to have a look at it under the microscope. So he opened it. And they, he was next to a flu pipe, and the flu pipe went upstairs into the atmosphere, and it was carrying the smallpox virus. And there was a photographer working upstairs, and her name was Janet Parker. And she caught smallpox. And because smallpox had been eradicated, nobody ever thought to treat it as smallpox, and she died. Mm -hmm. And she was the second last person, the last person to die from smallpox, and the second last person in the world to die because of smallpox, because Henry Benson took his own life a few weeks later. And, uh, 
I look at that and say, is this the way the world will end? There are the, the people of this world who say science is clever, humanism is right, and we will finally conquer everything that needs to be conquered. Every illness will go, and we will live in a perfect utopia. Or will the world, like smallpox, spread and kill everybody? And so I've got a problem that I think I quoted the other night, a little girl. It's called The End, as by Winnie the Pooh, or, I'm sorry, by Adrian Norman, who wrote Winnie the Pooh. When I was one, I was just begun. When I was two, I was nearly new. When I was three, I was hardly seen. When I was four, I was not much more. When I was five, I was just alive, but now I'm six. I'm as clever as clever, so I think I'll be six now forever and ever. And the bottom line really describes what mankind will do. Now, I'm only going to go back in the lifetime of most of us here, of the older ones, of some very significant things that happened and have happened in the last 50 years. And uh, the Vietnam War was the most unusual war because it was a war that America lost and that we lost. Now, I was in the uh, first group of... Uh, of uh, Oh, come on, Alan, you were one of them. National Service. I was called up by lottery and Alan was too. And neither of us got to Vietnam, but uh, I remember Pak Pangolin and uh, seeing the army camps. And uh, when the Australian vets came back from Vietnam, they slunk in. They were never honoured for what they tried to do and it has taken 40 or 50 years for us to start recognising. We lost quite a few of our best young men. And uh, see those fit looking young men? Well, they're now my age and your age now. Because time goes on. Now, the Vietnam War was, was dreadful and it changed the mentality and it had a deep effect on America. So I'm looking at now at the American presidents from the time that I have been alive. So we start off with, who is he? There's a little spare chance. Hmm? Oh. Well, I'll tell you Roosevelt, but you got the right surname. Oh, Franklin D. Roosevelt. Franklin. He was the last three-term president of the United States under the Constitution. You can only serve for two terms now. So the next one was who? Mm -hmm. ah. Harry S. Truman. Truman, that's it. The next one? Dwight Eisenhower. Dwight D. Eisenhower. Five star general and two term president of the United States. Who followed him? Charles Fitchin. <laughs> Who? Charles Fitchin. Yeah, I'm testing you this time. As soon as I'm served a picture, you'll get back and you'll know. Kennedy, Kennedy, Kennedy. Now, JFK started to redefine uh, morality in uh, US presidents. And uh, he was one of the greatest uh, womanizers, philanderers ever. And. Uh, They've done psychological studies that sometimes very great leaders have a super drive sex power, sexual drive, and he certainly was. And he died at the height of his presidency, which was called Camelot, and what was the date? 23rd of November, 1963. I can remember I was standing on the steps of the Mildura Church because it was the 23rd of November over here and the whole world was in total shock. And who remembers the total shock? Not many of us, but that really hit us, didn't it? And the same as you, we were walking in the church and someone present, Kenny's just been shot this morning. Yeah. As I walked in the church. And my mother's reaction was, what are you doing listening to radio on Saturdays? But the news got around. Who came after Kennedy? I think I missed him out. Yeah, I did. Uh, because I left uh, Lyndon B. Johnson. And then we had Tricky Dicky. 
And they say that of all the presidents, the one with the highest IQ was Richard Nixon and Bill Clinton. And he was followed by um, uh, Lyndon B. Johnson and then Nixon and then Gerald Ford when uh, this guy resigned. And then we got Bill Clinton. Well, he started to refine, uh, uh, redefine morality with a bit, bit of uh, help from Monica. <laughs> Who came after Bill? Well, we've missed another one because it was this guy's father, George Bush Senior, and uh, probably the, the least smart of all the presidents, this guy, George W. Uh, but he acted very wisely, I thought, during the, um, after the bombing of the Twin Towers, but he did declare a war, and uh, for the wrong reasons. And after that, we've got... Uh, yeah, yeah, look up, just a whole lot. I just sort of grab these at, at uh, random. Uh, Jimmy Carter came in there as well. And then, uh, who would have thought that a big, great actor could have been, made such a cunning president as Ronald Reagan was? Anyhow, we come down to the future, and guess who we have? He's a clown. Yes. I just shudder for what I think is going to happen. But that's my favourite picture of it. Uh, that's the one they hang in the concrete. We didn't do a painting. <laughs> but I want to show you a graph. And this uh, graph is my own devising. It's a knowledge graph. And along this axis here, we have time. And along here, we have the rise of knowledge. We come back to the creation, and we pretty well lived in the Stone Age. That's all that man needed because the earth was so plentiful and there was no need to uh, have iron and steel. And so the graph commences and marches along to about the year 3000 BC, and uh, we've got the earth has been destroyed, the Egyptian Empire starts up, and uh, that line is rising ever so gently. We have invented the wheel and the lever, and uh, the Egyptians learned how to craft bronze and gold uh, and a bit of iron, but it was very crude. And we go on to 2000 BC and not much more. Uh, you'd hardly recognize any change in technology in th over a thousand or so years period. The might put fancy spokes on the wheel, but there were no bearings. It was still greased by grease. And uh, 1000 BC, and around the time of David, and uh, come to the time of Christ, and technology hadn't changed. Christ was a carpenter and he would have had uh, a metal bladed plane and perhaps a saw and a drill and that would have been a treasured heirloom that would have passed from father to son for many generations and your entire toolkit you could carry on your back. And this is the electric tools I've got in my shed now. Uh, it's a different world. So we come to about 1080 and it still hasn't changed come right forward, oh, oh, something's happening. And in the 1700s, um, it was strange how it started. They had a season of about 15 years of, of very bountiful harvests in the UK and in Europe. And a lot of things happened. There was, uh, with a crops, there was prosperity and the landowners had the opportunity to um, think and tinker and they started to invent things. We also it coincides with the Renaissance and people like Stradivarius were making beautiful violins and uh, carriages became more sophisticated. Uh, irons and steel became much more refined because I'm a, a knife uh, junkie, you go to Japan and see what they were doing with their samurai swords and the way 
they were there, and, and even I've seen some of them, 600 years old, just the most gorgeous steel. But all of a sudden, this, this graphic, uh, the graphical knowledge is going up, and the agrarian or the agricultural revolution turned into the industrial revolutions, and we come to uh, about the 1900s, and we've got steam engines, and uh, man is hoping to fly, and of course the machine that he first flew in, made by the Wright brothers, was extremely primitive. Is that Tom Edison and Ford, one of those great yep. things? Yep. Uh, Edison and Ford were in the early days of, of the last century. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Ford lived through 1948. Um, Edison, uh, Ford, uh, his, he didn't invent the internal combustion engine that was done by Gottlieb, Daimler, and, and Benz. But uh, he, he devised mass productions. And uh, Edison was into electronics and uh, uh, Graham Alexander Bell and the telephone. But you look what happens as we go through the last century. That line starts to go almost vertical. Mm -hmm. And I press it again, <coughs> bang. Uh, and it's only about here. What were the two greatest inventions, by the way, of all time? Yeah. One of them occurs here. I accept all the answers. They can be well, I'll try, I'll try for the steam, steam power. So I think it was a bit later than that. Yeah, it was a bit later. Yep. And you can thank Watt and Stevenson. Watt invented the... Uh, and Newcomb, I think, it was there as well. So what was the great invention that allowed that to happen? Printing press. The movable type printing press. They had woodcut printing presses, but when it was movable type, there was an absolute explosion of knowledge. Until you get today, and knowledge increases once every three months. If I had have appeared with my iPhone at school in the early 60s when I finished school, they would have been blown away. And if I could have said, okay, um, I just want to uh, Skype, so what Skype? I'll show you and talk to somebody on the other side of the world. You could be burned for witchcraft just about. And, and if I want to know something, I mean, I'm a terror in a service school lesson. If I'm not sure of something, I get out of Google. And we just take for granted. And what alarms me is my grandchildren. They just take it totally for granted. And if I get stuck, I'll help you, Grandpa. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, Knowledge cannot increase, and of course we now get just past 2000, we're in 2017, and uh, if we live another 50 years, we will be blown away by what they come up with. The next great invention was the invention of the personal computer. Um, have you ever seen these talking birthday cards? You open them up and they sing happy birthday, well, you're holding more computing power that existed on the day the Second World War finished. And uh, the first computer would have occupied four or five buildings the size of this one, and another four or five buildings full of air conditioning equipment to keep it cool so it could operate. Neil Armstrong walked on the moon with the same computing power that you had in a Commodore 64. Do you remember those? 64 bits. That was just Now there's going to be a consequence, and with that is trying to feed the world. Now people think that my my PhD is in art theology or education, but the both wrong. I'm actually a geographer, and that's why this topic interests me. Food production, human population. One is one the axis is food production. The other one is population. These are trained trying to keep up. I think I can, I think I can, I hope I can, I really hope I can, man, I hope I can, we are not keeping up. Now, I've been interested to uh, look at the big uh, cargo ships in the harbour here at Portland, and, and they've been filled with wheat, I take it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, it's chipping off overseas. 
there is more than enough wheat and rice being uh, produced in the world so that nobody will ever go hungry. But by the time it chops out of port and gets distributed, uh, corruption and greed set in and it goes to different places and there is an enormous amount of wastage. Um, and we are not keeping up with food. So you look at uh, human population through history, it almost follows the knowledge graph, doesn't it? From about uh, 4000 BC, when the world was created, and up to through this forecast in 2025, through Stone Ages, Bronze Iron, Middle Ages, and the Modern Age, uh, world population has gone up. And uh, where are we in all of this? Well, this was actually done in 1972, and this graph could now sit about there. And uh, you look at food output per capita output, and there's a sudden drop. We are not producing enough food, and uh, your natural resources are being used up uh, by uh, four ecological uh, processes and capitalism. The definition of capitalism is you don't grow, you decline. And as long as there is a profit to be made out of the earth or on the ground or fish in the sea, capitalism will drive along until we use it all up. Uh, and that is one of the facts. And uh, the population, of course, uh, population graph uh, is actually now false. It's uh, now should be about there. And so we are reaching a point where something has to happen. So I want to just change track and look at the church in the 21st century, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. How well do we understand uh, 21st century Adventist? And I'm going to put you in your place. Remember the last time you were told that? Get ready to be put in your place. Where are you? Can you read that all right? Seniors are those, this is just a loose definition, but it is commonly accepted. Those people born before 20, 1925 are now age 92 or plus. I bet we've got no seniors here in this room. Put them a lot of makeup this morning. Okay. So not here. Can we confess? I am a builder because I was born in 1945. Any other builders here? Are you a builder? I'm so glad you turned up from because I would have been the loveliest person in the world. <laughs> now, how do you feel about that one? You and I are on the way out. <laughs> Terrible thing to say. You and I are going to live for a long time yet. But uh, well, in a cross section of the church, uh, we're nailing it, except the Kurumbal, which has the largest uh, um, retirement villages. And uh, one of our church members turned 105 two weeks ago. Um, was it 106? Yeah. And there's a couple of centenarians in, in there. Well, that's the problem with the graphics because people have to go there to retire because yeah. they have to retire. Yeah, yeah. I know. So it's a skewed, uh, skewed yeah. statistic. Yeah. Okay, how many baby boomers have we got here? Yeah? <laughs> Alright. You're getting old. <laughs> how many Generation X? <laughs> well, you used to be the rat bags of this world. Look at you, you're now responsible citizen. <laughs> Put your hands up because I think you're boasting. Yeah. How many Generation X? Why? No, generation Y. Yeah, well, you look very responsible to me. Uh, I hope I don't embarrass you in the moment. Uh, generation Z. Good. Okay. Do you know how to tell Generation Y? It's very easy. <laughs> I think that's the craziest fashion I've ever seen. But that diagram is now going out of date. If you look at the date, 2008, 
and most of them now are corporate bankers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, lawyers, yeah. Uh, politicians, yeah. preservers. But listen to this. By 2030, 90% of our membership will have been born in the 21st century. And that is going to change the demographics of this church. Whether we like it or not. Living in expectation. Now, here comes the boring bit. If you're going to go to sleep, it'll be in the next five minutes, but we're going to read a few stats here. Living in expectation. Can you see the screen then, by the way? I'll oh, just yeah. stand back. Living in expectation. We've been waiting for Christ to return since 1844. 1844 has been a hallmark date in the Adventist Church. 21st century Adventists are learning to wait in a different way. Today, we enjoy the anticipation rather than the event. My parents' generation was preoccupied with how long and when, and older Adventists need to anticipate the second return of Christ in the same way in which the younger generation waits. I'll explain that. 21st century Adventists are more interested in seeing and doing the truth than ever before. And one thing I have noticed as the years have gone by, uh, is that uh, our young people who are leaders of the church are far more capable and willing to talk about their spiritual experience than we did. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, when we were, Bill, that when we were at school, the trouble we did, you just look at the floor. I mean, mm -hmm. it was something very private and you didn't share it. Uh, try visiting a Sabbath school class run by the young people and compare it with a class being conducted by the seniors. Pay attention to the 21st century Adventists in the young people's class, because whether we like it or not, they are the ones who will take over the church. Now, 1844 sprung a whole heap of uh, prophets. And uh, because it wasn't just William Miller who became interested in the prophecy of 1844. And uh, this was Joanna Southcott. If you've ever, if you're a student of literature and read Charles Dickens, uh, A Tale of Two Cities, she gets a mention in the very first page, Mrs. Southcott, and she had quite a following. And uh, she claimed that uh, she uh, was going to give birth to the Messiah. And by this stage, she was in her 50s, and she was going to give birth to the Messiah, and she wrote a whole lot of prophecy. She put it in a trunk, and it wasn't to be opened until such time as the world believed that she was a prophet. And uh, when she fell pregnant, she and this uh, um, cartoon from an old, old English newspaper, Punch magazine, was not intended not intent to be rude, but she went to a group of doctors to prove that she had an expanded belly. And there they are uh, looking at her and blushing. Uh, but she actually died a few months after this from a tumor, which made her look pregnant. She was pregnant and her box is still unopened because the world is not believing her yet. So they did uh, sneak it into an x-ray machine and that's what's inside. It looks like an old pistol and bits of rubbish and it has never been opened. Uh, but it was William Miller who started to think things through. And of course, he felt that a trap that many people had fallen for, they put a date. And, uh, and the, the Bible tells us nobody knows, not even Jesus knows the date of the world's end of the world. He's only his father knows. But they did their mathematics and they came up with a particular date. And that date in October, uh, October the 22 or 23, passed. They were absolutely shattered. And he wrote, Thank you for reading Our expectation, this is really sad, beautifully written, but so full of pathos. Our expectations were raised high, and thus we look for our coming Lord until the top clock toll 12 at midnight. The day had then passed, and our disappointment became a certainty. Our fondest hopes and expectations were blasted, and such a spirit of weeping came over us as I had never experienced before. It seemed that the loss of all earthly friends could have been no comparison. We wept and wept 
and pulled the deck. And it was a very, very sad. So, well, from that, from the ashes of the great disappointment, uh, arose the Seventh Adventist Church. And with that came uh, the writings of Ellen White. Now, uh, I've had personal battles in my life with the spirit of prophecy because I was in that era and there are people sitting here with me who will testify to the same experience where Alan White was ran down our necks whether we liked it or not. Mm -hmm. Breakfast, lunch and tea. If as a young worker for the church, if I didn't give a god fall and a quote from the spirit of prophecy, I was just about taken up behind the woodshed and, 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 and dealt with. And uh, there was a reaction finally. Um, she was more used to the church when after she died. The same way that Lenin was and Mount Satron. Uh, when Lenin died, they immediately quoted him with great freedom and they formed their government from that. And that was 1918, 1917. And then by 1930, uh, that was running thin, this constant ramming down the neck. And so they, uh, Stalin was in power and he, uh, he instituted a pogrom, which is a cleansing which took the lives of 15 million people. In, the, in China, it was a cultural revolution. Another 50 million people were wiped out because they would not adhere to the, the, the set line. It happened in a much milder form in the Adventist church in the 19, early 1980s uh, over Desmond Ford, whom I know well and I still respect. But it split the church. We lost 195 ministers. My younger brother was a minister for 17 years and he lost it. And we've had to reevaluate the writings of Ellen White because on some occasions she reflected the views of experts around her but her messages in health are centuries above what is even now happening. Mm -hmm. And I went to a conference once, and it was a, a government conference, and the convener, who was an extremely well-educated professor, he said, this might surprise you, but I've got a book here that was written in 1915, uh, sorry, 1900, and is the greatest theory of education that has ever been written is not of the book education. And uh, uh, this is just an aside, it was reading uh, Patriarchs and Prophets when I was 15 that just thrilled my heart. And then I read the Zara Ages and that softened my heart. You can't read those without being drawn close to Christ. Mm -hmm. If we, and a lot of the problem is they have applied critical analysis of her writing as far as plagiarism is concerned by using 21st century literary uh, and scientific techniques. And if you looked at my doctoral thesis, which is now 23 years old, and the modern system, they probably want to take it off me. Because I broke every rule in the book as far as ethics was concerned. Um, and so I reevaluated, and uh, I believe that she was an expired, uh, expired <laughs> inspired uh, minister, uh, messenger from God. And we ignore what she has written at our peril. And I believe we now take a more intelligent view, we use her, but we don't quote her like scripture. She illuminates the Bible, she didn't write it. Yeah. And she would turn in her grave if she knew how her writings were merged, combined, manipulated, reinterpreted after she died. And so we get to the 21st century Adventist, and my generation, a lot of them left the church because of the way the spirit of prophecy was ran down the next and the harshness that many older Adventists had, but there is a reason for it. I don't blame them one little bit. 21st century Adventists believe in working while waiting. This is not universal, certainly observable. 
compare this to 1843 when some little riots did not plant their crops in anticipation of the second return of Jesus. They were so sure it was about to happen. 21st century Adventists are interested in environmental reform. Compare this with the leather rip mentality of some older Adventists. 21st century Adventists are now more goal background with that. Oh, the 21st century Adventist is now more goal oriented to a longer future on our planet than our fathers thought. My grandparents, when they became Adventists in 1912, they sold all their rubbish shares. Uh, and they said, we're, we'll get rid of all our money, the Lord is coming in the next two or three years, we're never going to have to educate our sons. Well, the last of their sons died at age 98 two years ago. Um, and uh, they were blessed with their faithfulness, but they were never rich, and they would have been if they hadn't hung on to their shares. Um, but they felt that they, the Lord was coming. Uh, is waiting going to lessen interest in prophecy? Probably not, but we need to acknowledge that 1844 is now viewed differently. We affirm that prophecy that affirms how we work as well as wait. Um, 21st century Adventists are very conscious of these things in a more up-to-date context than they are often credited with. They are not interested in the falling stars. So that's all we've, all we've got, the falling stars, the dark day, and the Great Lisbon Earthquake. That was a long, long time ago. Today is a modern setting, even though they may not connect with the events surrounding 1844, we still need to inform them. Some people claim that our generation is preoccupied with being right, even more than being faithful. And you know why? With my grandparents, uh, both of them on the paternal and maternal side, became served there, but it's the first thing they did was lose their jobs. Uh, people who worshipped on Saturday, if you weren't Jews, were about as rare as feather frogs. And uh, my grandfather, Harry, he was shown the door. His father never spoke to him for the rest of his life because he was a Presbyterian Sunday keeper. And it was unthinkable that they should break the Lord's Day. And of course, we know how the Lord's Day was changed and the Catholic Church admits it. Now, I'm not bagging Catholics because, as I mentioned the other night, there was a Catholic brother who brought me to Christ. But today it is such a rare thing and people don't understand the Lord's Day is Sunday as far as they're concerned. Um, but because they lost their jobs, they were tossed out of home, they were going to be jolly well sure that what they believed was exactly right. They had to know the truth because it had cost them hugely. And so my mother and father, who have both been dead for many years, uh, it was not the pure truth. Oh, I don't want to listen to these happy, clappy people, it's the truth that counts. And it was a very rigid truth, and we've moved on a little bit since then. And uh, you read this statement. Some people claim that our generation is preoccupied with being right, even more than being faithful. 21st century Adventists like to be right. The truth is important. I wouldn't be bothered with a little minority church unless they have what I felt and believe was true. But it's not so much their preoccupation, they're more adaptable to reposition themselves as they discover something is wrong. Our effective witness to the world does not so much depend on being right, but being faithful. I notice. Um, Normally you go and preach in churches of other denominations. You would have just about been to fellowship for this doing that four years ago. I know. But today we are not into ecumenicalism, but we are much more open and prepared to listen because there are many wonderful, wonderful Christians in other churches. So how can we conclude? You've done pretty well to stay awake through all this, by the way, and interrupt if you feel free. What can we conclude? The church is in good hands because the 21st century Adventists have built their faith on Christ. They do and then learn. We learn and then try to do. Can you see the difference? That's the essential difference between, sorry Rob, between our generation 
and the generations that have followed. But I think Ron and I are a bit more accommodating. Now, I want to show you a picture. You know what that is? Well, the baby boomers are more accommodating. Sorry? <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm tea. I'm being a bit naughty. No, no, I'm being naughty. You've been totally naughty. Uh, no, I, mean, I agree with you. <laughs> you know what this is a picture of? Give me anything. It's my father's head. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my dad was a brilliant orthopedic surgeon. If any of you have got artificial hips, it comes from the technology that he developed. He replaced over 3,000 hips. And on his grave, I planted an artificial hip. And I asked the interviewer before he died as to whether he'd ever lost a patient through carelessness. In 56 years of standing at the operating table, he looked me in the eye and he said, never. But he thought, he said, I lost two patients on the table because I made a wrong decision. I had to cut and I didn't know where to cut and it cost me my life and he still grieved over that. I um, was taking Mark Bush, he loved the bush. And uh, we're packing the car. 4th of April, 1997, I remember it well. Because as he was going to the car, he was just sort of staggering slightly to the left. And I said, are you all right? He said, I'm not sure. So I rang my brother, who's a radiologist, and I said, Dad's not well. And I said, I'm not taking you out in the bush if you're not well. And normally he'd say, I'll be right, I'll be right. But he said, maybe you're right. So Brian put him through a uh, MRI the next day. And he called me one side to have a look at the shop, which doesn't look like this, but inside the four great big brain tumors from a melanoma. He'd had the melanoma for a few years, and uh, eight years after it was excised, but they grow as tiny, tiny little seeds, and uh, you don't notice them. He never knew that he had brain tumors until they grew to a certain size. And when they grew to a certain size, they started to cause pressure on the brain, and no one can ever predict how their brain tumors are going to affect the person who has them because they put pressure in, in different spots. And he started to stagger, and I looked at his uh, logbook in his car. Meticulous, he had beautiful handwriting. Until the last month or so, I noticed that the writing was very spidering. I realized something was wrong. Of course, Mark, you knew my parents well. And, uh, it was all over in 10 months. And the hard part was watching a person of his intellect, uh, watching a crumble, and he became like nothing but a battling wreck towards the end. He was saying and doing the strange things. He lost all his dignity, and uh, he was a very imposing person. He was, you didn't ignore him in the crowd. And he died. So let's go on. That's our world. And in our world are growing more things, and they've been growing for a long time, but they are getting bigger and bigger, and they are starting to intersect. And so I've used the same illustration. What are they? Well, it appears that once a society develops beyond a certain level of complexity, it becomes increasingly fragile. Eventually it reaches a point at which even a relatively minor disturbance can bring everything crashing down. That would describe my father's head, that describes the world, because our ecology is way up the whack. Um, as we talk they, every five minutes, an area in the Amazonian rainforest the size of eight football pitches is being burnt. Great. Looking for oil, maybe crops. And you can't go along that way. I showed you the population graph, I showed you the food production graph. Capitalism, I've done a lot of work on capitalism because uh, they keep on using that resources. And you must make a profit. 
That's an island, and you probably wouldn't guess where it is because it's taken up space, but that is uh, Easter Island. And even from space you can tell there are no trees. It used to be a beautifully forested country. Everybody lived happy, and uh, they started to use up the trees. The population grew until it became a Malthusian trap. You know what Malthusian trap is? Reverend Thomas Malthus in the 17th century came up with a theory and it looked like a graph. The population will grow and then it'll get to a crisis point and it will drop. Uh, the, great, uh, the Great Death, the plagues of uh, Europe in the 13th century, for example. Population dropped. Trees were dropping, so they said we must appease the gods. So to appease the gods, they said we must make these good monoliths. And these are whopping. Now, how do you get them to stand up? You have to use timber, long timber poles. That's all right, they had wood, and they kept on using them. And they kept on using them, trying to appease the gods because they were overpopulated and uh, it was just becoming a road of grassland. The forest had gone, but they used their last piece of timber to put up the last monolith. In fact, if you go there, you'll see some monoliths on the ground because they're out of timber. And then, over the horizon one day, came a British warship. And guess what it was made of? Wood! The most precious thing that they could think of was wood. And so they immediately surrendered and worshipped it as a god. Look at the statement. History repeats itself, but every time it does, the price goes up. And uh, we are in that stage where power is to stop it. I mean, if you look at South Australia over the last few weeks and its power crisis, um, we have dilly Delhi. What really annoys me, uh, my land cruise was on gas. And I was paying mm -hmm. 70, 80, 90 dollars for gas, and we we're selling it to the Chinese for six cents a litre. And now we're buying it back off them. Hello. Mm -hmm. So we go back to our world. We're in a global village. We cannot live on our own. If I need oranges, and I look at the sticker, they're just as likely to come from California. Um, my computer. That's made in China. Was made in Korea. Oh, no, that might be Dell. Might be made in Korea. Um, our cars. Well, goodbye Holland. Goodbye Carl. Aren't they? Yes. And, and, and they're all overseas. Uh, our food supplies are from overseas. If anything goes wrong, start walking, fellas. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have what they call the Dorrington effect. Now, Dorrington is not. The Dorrington thing out there, isn't it? Yes. The Dorrington effect was discovered by an English scientist from a solar flare that happened about 150 years ago and it paralyzed uh, industrial England because it changed weather. It just, and if we get a Dorrington uh, effect uh, solar flare, it would shut down every computer in the world. Now you imagine if the computer suddenly shut down. This is not, I'm not trying to scare you. The computer suddenly shut down. Uh, you better wish you had a garden with your own vegetables growing in it. And plenty of honey. Uh, because Woolworths would not be able to deliver a single thing. They're all computerized. Petrol stations wouldn't be able to deliver petrol. You wouldn't be able to order anything or do anything or buy anything except what was in your kitchen cupboard. And I'd be going out and saying, come on tomatoes, keep growing, I'm going to eat your urban green and dig up the potatoes and we keep going for a while. But it is that serious and face that with a Malthusian trap and there could be multiple tumors. But we're not told for nothing that the final events of this world will be very quick and very cataclysmic. And uh, uh, that's interesting because the Bible actually says that medieval curses. Yeah, 
Yep, and uh, so I want to get seven and a half on. Uh, I mean, the fact that uh, New South Wales has had the highest rainfall for, for much of March pretty well ever is because we've had a hot summer and the sea has heated by two degrees and has sucked in the, the dry air uh, from the inland that collided over the uh, Great Divide Range and there was a big dump. Um, and that would be repeated the El Nino. And uh, uh, we choose not to think about it. Politicians don't because they want to keep going on a popular vote. And uh, when it happens, they'll be yelling and crying and screaming. And everybody will come together and say we need to worship the same way. And we'll come up against the Sabbath question again. That is the commandment that Satan hates more than anything else. I want to leave you with a text. It's a bit hard to read. Very hard to read. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. And I've got a final slide and I'm not sure that it's going to work. It's a, uh, it's a parachutist, professional photographer, and he is taking a photograph of the next time he jumps himself, taking a photograph of a young couple jumping in tandem, and the photographer's name is Ivan McGuire, and he gets them going down. When they open, look for a hand at the bottom of the screen. See the hand? Mm -hmm. At that moment, Ivan McGuire suddenly realizes he's jumped out without a parachute. <gasps> mm -hmm. And they found the mangled wreckage of his camera. And the last thing he said, oh my God, no. And so that is us. If we choose to leap out, without the parachute of the Bible as our guide and our safekeeping, that will be the end of us. That was a shot of a finish with, wasn't it? <laughs> Can I pray for you? Dear Father, we thank you that you created the world and you loved us. Satan came in and spoiled it, spoiled us. But you still love us and you provided a plan of salvation. And you have said this world will come to an end. It will be like the days before the flood. And we will destroy this world. But the last moment, because the true results of sin will then be demonstrated to the world, you will come and you will save your people. Keep us true and faithful today, we ask in your name. Amen.